glaciers are not exactly sterile. They, they represent what was happening in the environment of the snow at the time. And any dead animals and things or um, other organic matter that was encompassed in it will be rotted away and be taken down with the glacier. Most of you know what Traveller's Diarrhea is because I dare say most of us here have actually had it. It's clearly a diarrheal illness that you acquire whilst travelling. But why do we get it and what places are you more likely to get it? And more importantly, what can we do about it? Now, this is looking at general travellers, not particularly expeditioners. And you can see that the rate of getting Traveller's Diarrhea in countries such as the UK if you travel in the UK is about 2% or so. It's quite low in the uh, more affluent areas of the world like North America and Australia, etc. cetera. Um, more prevalent in other parts of the world. And of course the hot spots are the hot tropical humid areas with uh, relatively poor economies, poor infrastructure, hygiene and water supplies. So it's particularly common in Africa, Central Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, Southeast Asia, Central America and parts of, uh, of South America and hence the risk is broadly related to the socio-economic uh, status of the country and in these countries it can be as much as 40 or 50 percent depending on activity there. Uh, it used to be considered to be more 65 percent plus but over the last 20 years few studies have actually showed an instance greater than 50 percent and that really reflects the growing economies in many of these countries and improvement in the tourist uh, um, infrastructure. Now there is a dizzying array of organisms which can uh, give you diarrhea as you probably know. Uh, everyone has heard of norovirus particularly notorious for causing outbreaks in closed environments such as cruise ships uh, notice coronavirus is in there as well, uh, not the current one, although there is some GI problems with that. Uh, but a lot of the uh, diarrheas are actually caused by bacteria, particularly in hot, humid environments with problems with hygiene. Uh, some of these are actually quite invasive, some of the E. coli are quite invasive, but particularly Campylobacter, Shigella, Salmonellas. And what do we mean by invasive? We mean it just doesn't alter the fluid balance into and out of the gut, giving you loose motions. They actually invade the gut wall, start causing an immune reaction, inflammation, so you get bleeding and pus in, in the stools uh, and general systemic symptoms, often high temperatures, abdominal pain, often quite acute onset as well. Uh, and that is known as dysentery, which you definitely do not want. And we know from studies that uh, in some parts of the world, Southeast Asia and Latin America particularly, 70 to 80 percent of these diarrheas are definitely caused by bacterial organisms and sometimes more than one. So you know this I'm sure. Why do you get diarrhea? It's because these organisms inhabit the guts of animals or people and for some reason they end up in your mouth. Now this is usually because of poor hygiene as we mentioned, not washing hands, and of course we're now all experts in washing hands, not washing hands after defecation, not washing hands before eating, not washing hands before preparing food, contamination of water supplies, and in some parts of the world there's a custom of using human feces as a fertilizer, so-called night soil, which of course contaminates food substances, which if they're not prepared properly can then lead on to, uh, to diarrhea. This is a quite illustrative slide uh, provided by the tear fund which is quite useful um, presentation probably most of you have had a couple of these many of them are just uh, watery diarrhea not specific maybe some nausea a little bit of vomiting abdominal pain perhaps a little bit of colic not too bad uh, most people can cope with it and of course then there's the bacterial dysenteries much more significant much more ill high temperatures abdominal pain uh, the, the blood and the mucus you may not see initially, just be aware of that. And then there's a, a, a few others such as uh, the slow more burning ones, uh, parasitic organisms, protozoa like Giardia and Amoeba, which tend to drag on a little bit. And there's also the classic food poisoning where it's not so much the actual bacteria that's been ingested, 
it's a preformed toxin in the food so the onset is really quite rapid one to five hours and then you're throwing up and, and diarrhea off at the same time and, and just at the point where you, you're thinking that you really can't stand this anymore about 12 hours later it, it switches off and also be mindful that there are other causes of diarrhea just because you happen to be traveling this could be your first case of colitis or Crohn's even uh, malaria can cause diarrhea so so just be aware of that so what do we do about this well most of them will actually settle as you probably experience bacteria three days up to a week maybe viruses a little less to so say the protozoas can go on a little bit longer um, incidentally the post travel irritable bowel syndrome is said to be at 1.5 percent but if it's a particularly severe traveler's diarrhea and prolonged that can be a lot higher almost as 10 percent so imagine you're at camp one say Primori or somewhere similar you've got the squirts just as you've got into your sleeping bag uh, you're really self-reliant and a traveler's diarrhea in remote environments is one of these illnesses where really the uh, the victim the diagnostician and the therapist are all the same person because there's just you and perhaps a friend and one would hope that you'd uh, given some forethought to this so you've kitted out your medical kit and because most of these depending on where you are are likely to be bacterial there's an argument for using antibiotics and indeed that has been the case and in fact antibiotics have been used prophylactically for many years uh, but the problem with that of course is that the more they're used prophylactically then uh, the more resistance occurs and so the general trend now is to avoid people taking them prophylactically but to use them as standby if you can't get access to medical help in the next 24 hours and particularly if you're deteriorating so we really need some sort of idea uh, of how how bad is this diarrhea so do I need to use antibiotics now or do, can I wait or what? And the classic grading of diarrhea, mostly for research purposes really, was just on the frequency of stools, where if it was six or nine times a day, it was classified as severe. The problem with that is that uh, you may have only one or two or three stools a day, but can be really quite unwell with it, with fever, and abdominal pain and, and, and prostration. So there was a meeting of experts commissioned by the International Society of Travel Medicine in 2017 who came up with a, a much more useful in the field grading system and this has subsequently been uh, adopted by our own uh, NICE. Uh, NICE give a very a balanced view of this actually it's well worth a read. And the new grading system is that Traveller's diarrhea is a sudden onset of abnormally loose or liquid freaks, frequent stools which in the victim's assessment is mild so it's tolerable not causing much distress, not forcing a change in plans, moderates, oh this is getting uncomfortable, it's interfering with travel, oh, I don't think I'll take that bus, I can't quite trust the farts, all the way through to severe, yeah, I'm not leaving the sleeping bag, I'm just absolutely not up for doing anything at all. And dysentery, that's with the blood and the mucus and often high fever, by definition is, is severe. So that's a much more useful in the field. So what treatments are available to us if we're out uh, on, uh, on a bivy or on a base camp somewhere. Clearly hydration is important. Um, now judging hydration clearly if you're thirsty you can uh, assume that you're pretty uh, dry uh, but it's said uh, traditionally that thirst is satiated fairly quickly by, by frequent drinking. Uh, that thinking's changed slightly but it is useful to look at your urine as you know if it's like tea it's going to be quite concentrated you're probably dehydrated if it's fairly clear after the first one of the day you're probably fairly hydrated the problem is that water on its own is not efficiently absorbed from the bowel it has to be linked to a glucose molecule uh, so it is important to be able to eat some form of carbohydrate this could be something like uh, rice or uh, biscuits or bread or mashed potato or anything you have really. Uh, if you have bananas, they're quite a useful form of carbohydrate. It almost looks like a, like a dietary fiber, uh, it gets through to the larger gut. Uh, but at the end of the day, if you can't tolerate any of those, there are official ORS, oral rehydration solutions. And I'm sure that uh, many people here have tried these. Every country has its own particular version of varying degrees of palatability. Most are based on the World Health Organization recipe. Antimotility agents such as loperamide, that's the uh, probably the most efficacious one. It's well tolerated, it's rapid acting. 
uh, usually in one to two hours. But bear that in mind, the dosing is two capsules, that's four milligram with the first diarrhea, and then the instructions are one further capsule of two milligram with every diarrhea, uh, up to a total of eight capsules, 16 milligrams a day. Uh, just be mindful, it does take one to two hours to work. So, uh, you know, if you've got diarrhea four times in that, you don't take four doses, just give it a little bit of time to work. It's well tolerated and it doesn't cross the blood brain barrier. Not licensed in children in most countries, though the BNF does, does list children's doses. Antiemetics are not in this current guidance, but I usually take something like Bucastem, which is a, um, a buccal version of Prochlorperazine, because the, the tablet version is all very well, but if you're vomiting, you can easily vomit the tablet back. This handily dissolves underneath the top lip, so you do need some moisture on your on your mouth membranes, otherwise it won't dissolve. And the advantage of this is that if you are vomiting, you can simply press your, your gum over it and, uh, and vomit past it, basically. So they're quite useful. And then we come to antibiotics. Now, traditional antibiotics such as uh, doxycycline, which were and still are used for malaria prophylaxis, previously had the advantage that they were prophylactic against travelers' diarrhea. Unfortunately, because of sustained use over many years, that is not the case anymore. And until recently, ciprofloxacin was the antibiotic of choice to the extent that it was mentioned in the Lonely Planet Guide. It's available in supermarkets for one or two dollars in places like Kathmandu. So it was extensively used throughout Southeast Asia and consequently invasive organisms like Campylobacter, which is one of the more common diarrhea organisms there, have now become resistant and this resistance is spreading. Additionally, uh, in 2017, 2018, there was an alert from the European Medicines Agency that there are reported cases of life-changing side effects with quinolones, of which this is one, where uh, tendons can snap. So it's really not to be used in people with tendinopathies, and that might include uh, people of uh, more elderly years, certainly over 60, or people on steroids or, or diabetics. So it's now lost its UK license for use in travellers' diarrhoea. So we're not really uh, using that. It can still be used in other parts of the world where they don't have such a degree of uh, ciprofloxacin resistance. The antibiotic of choice now is azithromycin, which uh, doesn't actually have a UK license, but it is recognized by NICE and uh, ISTM. It's 500 milligrams once a day. And of course, you have to give some thought to evacuation. You shouldn't really be leaving without knowing how you're going to get back and give some thought to how you would get off this mountain, a bit like the, uh, the Kenya case you just heard, uh, and uh, insurance to enable and facilitate that. So when would you use these antibiotics? Again, using the uh, modern classification, which is more useful, it's a self-determination score everyone to rehydrate but if it's mild not distressing not really interfering with activities you expect it to get better you may use loperamide say for that bus journey or just so you can sleep at night but it's, it's not obligatory more significant moderate diarrhea you may use loperamide on its own or you could use it with antibiotics depending on how badly you feel but for severe incapacitating diarrheas which just stops you from doing anything that you plan to do you should really be considering antibiotics in a remote area. Different, of course, if you're on holiday in, in Tenerife or a resort, you can easily get to, to healthcare. But in our circumstances of remote uh, field use, antibiotics uh, I would recommend to be part of your available medical kit. Now, if you don't see blood and pus and it's not high fever, can consider using the paramide as an adjunct. It's not recommended for use if there is dysentery, and that is because there is at least a theoretical risk of toxic megacolon, although a lot of that worry does seem to arise out of a, a single small study in the 1970s where, uh, where, where use of Lomatil, as it was then, uh, prolonged diarrhea with Shigella. But nevertheless, that is the, the recommendation currently. And uh, do remember that it is a communicable disease, so socially distance defecation, please. And uh, if anyone wants to read up any further about this, NAVNAG, which is the UK Public Health England Ad Travel Advisory Service, National Travel Health Network and Centre, uh, it's free advice, easily obtained. Um, you can look at these uh, advice guidelines from the ISTM. I was going to put the URL down, but it was uh, too long for everyone to copy down. But if you simply Google Traveller's Diarrhea by the author Mark Riddle, or there's a, an easier to read version by Bradley Connor, available on the American CDC.
So that's pretty much a gallop uh, through diarrhea. So um, I'll uh, pass you back to David and um, hope for some questions. Paul, thank you very much. That's uh, a great help. Um, a question came in via YouTube um, saying that uh, the person had heard that it's positively dangerous to drink glacial water because of the uh, micro particles in it. I'm sure most of us have come down off routes crossing glaciers absolutely gasping for a drink and have just sucked it out of the nearest pool we can find. Um, and I've survived. I, could I ask you what your views are on that? A couple of things about that. It, it's it, Glaciers form by successive layers of, of snow and ice compacting down. Of course, they take all the debris and the dead animals and things with them. So there's two components to this. There is the grinding up of all the rock as the glacier moves and you get this very fine, almost talcum powder like like precipitates in the water and that's said to have a, an appearance effect on the bowel uh, which can cause a sort of um, physical diarrhea if you like. Uh, so there's some merit in perhaps trying to uh, filter that out if you can. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, glaciers are not exactly sterile. They, they represent what was happening in the environment of the snow at the time and any dead animals and things or um, other organic matter that was encompassed in it will be rotted away and be taken down with the glacier. And of course, just like any water flow, it's, it's the human and animal activity in the watershed that's, that's uh, important. So if you're taking it from a glacier outflow and you're beho below the, the, the mountaineering hut above you, you're going to have to expect there's a, a certain um, organism load in it. So it depends on where you are as always. Having said that, I suspect there's not many people here that haven't drunk glacial meltwater. Does that answer the question or just confuse things more? Uh, well, like anything medical, Paul, um, we usually manage to confuse it. Um, having the number of doctors we've got here, we should be able to disagree on most the, things. The, the, the point I've, is about how you sterilise that water from that position of drawing it, I guess. Yep, and someone has asked, um, is there any type of water filter recommended? And this is, um, well, on a diploma level course, we can discuss this for hours. At my personal level, if I've got one, I like to filter water through a coarse filter, a mill bank bag mm. to get rid of the big lumps. And I'm a great believer in uh, iodine. To filter out those small particles of rock and things, you need a sort of 0.2 micron filter. But the problem with the filter and doing that, it will clog very quickly and you'll spend all your time scrubbing the filter, uh, particularly if it's a ceramic one or replacing your filters. Um, the, the mill bank bag will get rid of all the sort of larger debris, but not the very tiny things. And of course, it doesn't filter out um, large, uh, the bacteria and it certainly doesn't filter out viruses. There's a question or a, a comment from uh, Alex Metcalf saying, can UV light kill most harmful particles in the water? It can certainly uh, kill most uh, of the bugs uh, as long as it's not too silty and it can work. So I, I think UV is a good, good solution, mm. particularly in North America. Um, now, Nigel, did you say that? Was, uh, no, I see a hand up from Derek. Is that Derek right? Again? Yep, you've unmoved to me again. Yeah, it's a comment really on the purification of fluids at high altitude. I mean, you've made some very good points there about where you can or where you should take water from and where you shouldn't. But one thing from experience, is, uh, I'm a chemist, um, and one of the groups, that I, one of the people I was with some years ago um, was having vitamin C flavorings put into his drinks and then adding the sterilizer afterwards. Now that no one's mentioned this, but this is not good news because okay. iodine and chlorine react very, very rapidly with ascorbic acid, which is what vitamin C is. Absolutely. And that would basically stop it killing off any bacteria that, or viruses that are actually in this uh, solution. So the word of caution is do not add chlorine or iodine tablets to solutions that have actually got lots of vitamin C already in them. That's, that's exactly right, Derek. You can, you can sterilize clear uh, water that doesn't have any particulate matter in it with uh, the halogens like the chlorine and the, the, the iodine. Iodine is quite a little bit more efficacious in the field. Um, but it, it, I think it got voted as the worst taste uh, in some survey. 
and some people just can't stand it at all. I like it. it reminds me of expeditions and faraway places and, <laughs> and, and good comradeship. Um, but some people put citrate in after they've sterilized it to neutralize it, which it do, to neutralize right. the taste, yep. but it also neutralizes the effect, which means if you then use that same container with some citrate contamination, that you cannot then use it to sterilize the next batch. Uh, I think that's really quite important. The other thing to note, of course, is that um, uh, iodine is uh, classed as a, a biocide, and because the manufacturers never sought a European license, it's now not available in the whole of Europe for use for sterilizing water. It is still available in some pharmacies as 2% tincture of iodine, which is what the old stuff was. It just simply says on it for external use only. But it's largely been replaced now by, um, by chlorine dioxide, which is, is better in the sense it's more efficacious against cryptosporidium, which the, the chlorine and the, um, and the uh, iodine never did. Uh, but the, the, the difference with the chlorine dioxide is that whereas uh, plain chlorine and iodine would continue to work in the vessel to stop any further contamination, chlorine dioxide doesn't. Right. Thanks, Thank, thanks Paul. I've got a couple, couple more on YouTube. Um, right. I thought the paramide was not good for bacterial DNV. Best to empty the system? Is there evidence for this? And then yeah. Ben goes on to say, like trying to clean the bath with the plug-in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You're, you're right, the pyramide is not curative. Uh, it's, it's barely therapeutic. Uh, it's simply holding all the stuff in the bowel. And there's this sort of um, feeling that if you, you want to let this toxic effluent out, if you can get to the toilet. And yes, that would be a, a reasonable um, hypothesis. It, it, it is... It, it does actually promote absorption of fluid and salts, and it possibly has some mine, m minor anti-secretory properties, but it's, it's not classified as a therapy as such. It is simply bunging you up to, to let, make life easier. If, for example, you're, you're getting up every hour and can't sleep, or if you have to go on a bus journey or something similar. An important point to note is that if you use it uh, with antibiotics, there's about three and a half times the, the incidence of promotion of resistant organisms. So that is to be borne in mind. So if you can get to the loo, yes. Uh, if you can't, it can be used, but not in dysentery, of course. Um, thank you all. It's been a brilliant audience. We didn't know if it would work. And uh, I'd like to say thank you to everyone who's helped with this. Um, there's a massive IT team behind us because they've been dealing with some Luddites working very odd shifts. So thanks to people like Nigel, Tim, um, Matt, Michael and uh, Nick and a whole load of other people. Uh, we've been coached for this. Um, we relied on the, the old bedside manner of complete bullshit and bluffing, but you seem to have tolerated it very well. Um, Thanks to the audience who was so important. Those with an interest, do Google the British Mountain Medicine Society. You don't have to be a doctor. Next week's Alpine Clubcast 8 is entitled Agui de Peleron. Uh, Rab Carrington, Andy Parkin and John Bracey talk about new routing on the Peleron. In February 1975, Rab Carrington and Alan Rouse brought hard Scottish style climbing to the Alps with their winter ascent of the Terre Rebofa route on the Peleron above Chamonix. 17 years later, Andy Parkin and Mark Twight climbed the nearby Good and Evil, uh, sorry, Beyond Good and Evil. And in February 2020, 18 years after that, John Bracey, Matt Helliker, and Pete Whittaker added Beyond Reason. In their own way, each of these has a sense of set new standards for our sport. Um, but why has this corner at a Chamonix agreed been a test bed for the best climbers of their respective generations? Find out next week. Um, do have a look at our Alpine Club Library YouTube page where you can watch, share uh, all the previous Alpine Clubcasts and don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks all for joining us. Uh, stay active, stay safe and stay alert. Good night from London. <laughs> <laughs>